Hi everyone, my name is Ali, short for Ali Akbar Akbari Tawar, and I am going to give you a tutorial on how to use parallelized and out of memory data analysis using Dask in Python and DashDB and DBWare in SQL. I'm going preparing this video tutorial on the kind uh, invitation of Misha Teplis, she from Michigan University. This video is a backup plan so that no technical problem might arise during the tutorial. I'm going to use example of publicly accessible ORCID 2019 XML files. Those XML files are profiles of the researchers. So it includes researchers name and uh, the, the date they started their profile and some other detail that I will talk about afterwards. This tutorial is targeted to social scientists. And before we jump into the installation and requirement setup, I would like to talk a, a bit about why do we need to learn parallelization and out of memory computation. You might think today uh, there are uh, more and more computing power is available and with the increased RAM, uh, capacities, why do we need to learn parallelization? And my answer would be that the data has increased as well. So the size of data has increased and some tasks are embarrassingly repetitive. That means if I have, let's say, 10 XML files and I wish to parse them and take some metadata out of those files, these 10 files do not need to be processed one by one in an order, they can be processed simultaneously. Like if my machine has three or four cores, then I can process four of those files simultaneously instead of doing them one by one. And that takes say, that saves so much time from me. Here you will see another uh, a, a brief story of how this happened to me myself and I needed to learn. So the first step, in installation. So I will use 500 XML files from ORCID and in order to follow the steps required the steps, hopefully now that you are convinced parallelization is important for us, I will uh, clone this repository. So that means I will click on this clean button and then copy this URL here. I can download a zip, but this cloning here is much uh, better because it brings the history of the repository. And uh, in case I would like to contribute, I can even modify things and push back to the repository and similar things. So copying this URL, then I open a terminal on my Mac. And here I put git clone and drop the link to that repository. What happens is it takes a few uh, seconds because it's a small repository with only about one megabyte of files uh, sorry five megabytes of files and then what happens is now i have them so if i put ls i see that that directory if i change the directory to that so change directory cd to desk then if i put L, uh, ls again to list files then here i see that uh, the, these are the files in the same directory as it is shown on GitHub. Here, uh, what happens is I have listed some steps that are required for the setup. So I will put them on, the, on this side. And what happens is, so we cloned the repository already. And here I'm suggesting you to install Anaconda a Python because most of the libraries that I'm going to show you and task and those are a part of the Anaconda Python. So they have a package management service that is called Conda and that come that allows you to uh, install libraries uh, with, uh, with some configuration files like this YAML file that I have included in the repository. So what happens is after downloading that, and looking at the directory here, we have one YAML file, this one required YAML. If I open it with a text editor, you would see that this, I have 
given a name and the channels where it is going to download the uh, libraries from. Then there is, uh, for Windows users, they can keep using the same file because I'm on a Mac. So I will uh, comment this line out by putting a pound sign in the beginning. And then I will uncomment this line that is for Mac users. I will change my user here to put Ali because that's my user on my own Mac. What happens is these are the libraries that the uh, Conda is going to download, but it, it will download Python 3, NumPy, Pandas, Dask, PyArrow, JupyterLab. It will download beautiful soup and LHTML that are libraries that we use to parse those HTML files. I have kept these two libraries, but they are, we are not going to use them in this tutorial. Just uh, I, these are handy libraries too. All right, so what happens next is we open a terminal in the same directory. So now we are in the same directory as here. And then following this, the next step on my tutorial, and I'm assuming that you have already installed Anaconda Python. The next step is what I just said in uncommenting the uh, suitable URL in your own uh, based on your own repository. And now uh, what happens is I need to write conda env create f and then required environment yaml. So I saved that yaml file, I modified it, I saved it. Now it knows that I'm on a match and this is where I wish conda to install the libraries and the environment that I am building. This use of this environment management is nice because it keeps your current environment separate from any other environment on your machine and it reduces the possibility of mis mixing libraries or having problems, consistencies with the requirements. So this will take five to 10, 15 minutes. I am not going to show that on the tutorial. I have already followed that steps. So what happens is I will show you the output of it and that will be like this. So I will write, so this is the files that I downloaded. If you write conda info, it gives you information. Like, let me put it here. Conda info gives you information on your current uh, environment uh, that is in use, that is base for me. Then after you call conda create f required environment yaml, the, it is going to write something like this. So it is going to write collecting package metadata, then solving environment. And this is that step that will take five to 10 minutes and a little bit more. Then it is going to show you these lines that are downloading those libraries plus the requirements for them. It will download all of them and it will install. At the end, it will give you these lines that says your environment is ready. It is called task-db. You can activate it with this called conda activate task-db. So let me now assume that we are already on, have followed these steps and we are here. So all libraries as in, are installed. You can say here conda env list. It will tell me that I have base, then I have dash dash db. This other library uh, environment is what I use for my own work, but here these two are uh, will be shown on your computer base and dash dash db. Now I can say conda activate dash dash db, and then it shows it like a, in parentheses before your prompt. So it shows that this is the uh, environment in use. If I can put conda info, now it will write it here as well. That means that is the library in use. So we are now at this step. So we already checked that this environment is installed and it shows it like in parentheses before uh, your prompt. The next step is to download the Dutch DB uh, command line interface, CLI. That is what we are going to use in the next step. So I will show you just the website here. You can choose the CLI on this and it already understands your platform if it is a Mac or Linux or Windows, but you can change it based on your 
uh, operating system, then you download a zip file that is here. So I will, so I will click CLI macOS, then I will put zip and it's saved. I will download it and I will save it. That here. So I will just move it to the repository, to the folder where I'm working that is here. Now, what happens is in the next step, uh, so I will close that DB. In the next step, we need to do the same for DB world. So it's similar to uh, installing your Windows or Mac or Linux software. And here you can find community edition for different platforms. Please download the one that is suitable for your operating system and install it. And I have already done that. So I have it installed here. And you will see in a second, how is it like? Now I will close that TV here. And because we already installed all the needed libraries, I can now in the same terminal that I had and I activated this environment that we are going to use. Now I can call Jupyter Lab and it will open up a browser page for me. That is where my uh, where we are going to write Python code and prepare our data. So what I will do is the following. I will, and this is exactly. So I will remove the in, those files inside the output folder because those are what I have put in the output folder for our previous, for, to show you how it is like, the results. XML files are those 500 files, XML files that I mentioned from ORCID. And what I will do is I will now continue on these steps on the platform, so on GitHub. And I'm assuming that you already installed TBWare and this step, we are coming back to it, to how to connect it to uh, Dutch DB in a second. So now let me go ahead and maximize this so that we see the file. Okay, what is uh, Dask? Dask is a library in Python that allows you to use some familiar data formats like pandas, data frame on NumPy arrays and it allows you to process them in parallel. So imagine a pandas data frame that has one uh, table and each row is one observation and different columns are your variables. What happens is Dask allows you to extend this data frame into a parallelized version of it. So you can have a hundred thousand or millions of this, uh, these tables that will not even fit into your uh, machine's memory, but Dask knows that these tables are uh, connected to each other. So the variables goes over multiple uh, tables and Dask already knows that these tables are related. It offers you other possibilities like batch or delete, and uh, you can read about them on the hyperlinks that I have put here. The, I have linked that book here that uh, has helped me a lot learning how Dask works. And there are a lot of videos by the team, Dask's team on how the parallelization works and best practices. Be sure to check those best practices. So to come back to the XML files that I mentioned that are publicly available from ORCID 2019. And here I have put one example from one researcher. If you follow this link, you will see that researchers uh, profile online. So it has uh, the ORCID ID, then the name, first name, last name, and then uh, employment history and publications. So in the XML file that we downloaded from uh, the website. So you need to follow this link that I have put here. It is 10 gigabytes. It will take a little bit of time to download. And here I'm just showing you uh, 500 XML files and that includes 13 million researchers. But this 500 is just a sample. So I'm not going to parse all those 13 million profiles. As an example, I will just show you this 500. And Include inside those XML files, if you right click and open them in a 
text editor, let me do one, like in XML files, let me open this one, for example, with a text editor. Then you will see a structure that looks like this. So on the top, you have some uh, tags that are the default tags that comes from XML. Then you will have under person person you will have a path that is like this so let me search for person person to show you how is it like i'm sh showing you here so person person and this means that this, this tag is opened here and it is with this slash sign it means the tag is closed here like this so this is the orchid uh, id of that person then we have given name, we have family name, and other metadata that exist, like employment history and others could exist there. But this is another XML file, just to be clear. So that's why the first name and last name differs from this example I show here. Now, what happens is I have included Python code for Dansk and below the SQL code that we will use for DB and DBWare. But what I will do is, in the terminal, I already called Jupyter Lab, so it opened up this one. It opened a Jupyter notebook for us, and all the information I have already included there. So, what happens next is during my code, I will and uh, I am asking Dask to build a client. That means I'm importing the necessary file libraries, that is that data from here, pandas, beautiful soup, that allows me to parse the XML file time I uh, imported to be able to uh, record how much time it takes for this operation. Then I'm importing globe and OS to allow me to read all the files with wildcards, like, like saying, look at this directory and take all the XML files that are in that directory. As I described above, you, you can read in my description, I'm using dash delayed that allows me to parallelize a normal uh, Python function. And then I'm using dash distributed client and progress. So client here allows me to say how many workers do I need, need to have and how many threads per worker. So my uh, machine has, let's say, uh, eight CPUs, and then I can say build eight workers, and then how many threads per those uh, CPU cores would allow uh, defining how many files to be processed simultaneously. So I will leave that to Dask to decide, so it will just build the client on its own, and then I will print how this client looks like. Let me go to Jupyter Notebook here with the same code, now what happens is I will run it by with shift enter and to follow these steps that I mentioned. So now Dask has built this, cl this uh, client that I said. If I click on this link that it is written, that is Dask dashboard, it will open up like this. So it shows me those cores that it has built that it has decided to build four workers and I can go to workers, I can see their names, I can see how many memories they are using. So this dashboard is really helpful in showing you the steps that are taken. I will take it out and I will put it on this side of the screen because we want to see the progress. I will put this on this side. Now, in the next step, because I'm on the max and, and it is already under the same directory, so I will remove these two lines. I don't need them. And what happens is, minimize this as well and increase the font size here. So what happens is in the next code change, I'm giving a data DIR that is the directory where my XML files are. And then I give a results directory. That is where I wish to record the results of this process. So what happens is afterwards, I define one simple function that is a fun uh, one uh, python function with some try and uh, catch error and what does it do it reads one xml using the beautiful soap xml uh, parser that we had here 
then what happens is, so it reads, then it checks if there is a path under the HTML file. So in the HTML that I showed you, that was here, I would like to take, I would like to check path and then take the um, ID of that person. So uh, the ORCID ID of that person. So what happens is it searches if there is common path. So if I search for this common path here, you would see that in under common path, there's a text input that is the uh, ORCID ID of that person. Then I say search for personal details given names. It does that as well. And here it puts, it finds the text that is Jonathan. So I take, I say, take the text out. Then search for family name. Similarly, that takes this one. So Tinker. Then if you didn't find that, write problematic or kid ID or problematic first name or problematic last name. Then I convert all those information into a Pandas data frame and export that data frame. This is the function that does the job. What I do with Dask is that calling Dask delay that happens inside this one function with Dask delay, I call Dask to do that in parallel over multiple XML files. That uh, saves me time. And what happens is here, I'm using globe and OS to say, check that DIR, the directory of my input files, that was this one, so XML files. See if there are files with XML uh, extension, list them inside files. Then I build a list to save my file, my output. In a Python for loop, I Call Python, I asked Python to go over the files, that is this list of XML files, take one of them. Then I asked uh, Python to open that file, but I put open inside delayed, that is telling Dask not to do that operation just yet, but pile up all the steps of the operations that I need and then call them in parallel over different files. So what happens? I open the file with UTF-8 encoding, then I call beautiful soup saying that this file is XML. And afterwards I uh, call the, this one, ORCID file, that is the function I wrote here. And then I call that over this file here. And I append the result that is the this data frame that was exporting into this list that I made. Afterwards, I am taking this output DFs that is separate Python uh, pandas data frames, and I call dask dd from delay. I call I tell dask to make a one parallelized data frame out of those and repartition it, repartition it to 100 megabytes. That saves me. Uh, space because it saves a space that it takes from RAM because these files are really small. It repartitions them to pile them beside each other to be a little bit larger. But 100 megabytes is nice because it is fits in one worker's memory. Then I say uh, write it to a parquet uh, file under the uh, output directory and then print a status that tells me this is finished and how much time it took. So let me now run this one. So it first writes that the time that is started, then it goes and it does the operation that I asked it in parallel over those XML files. So, and during the time I wrote that tutorial, it took 52 seconds. So now we will see how much it will take. And here, if I check that, uh, that dashboard here, it shows that those tasks with the, uh, oops, that was too fast. So it took 64 seconds and it shows the tasks that are being done. Let me maximize this. 
Here in task stream, you see that each of my workers, that is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, because my machine has eight cores. Each of those workers took one, one file, it read the XML file, then it fed it into beautiful soap, and then it ran my function that was orchid files. And then at the end, they passed it. Let me see if I can zoom in on this. Uh, right, then it passes it to the final step that is merging the data frames. So let me come back to our uh, Jupyter notebook and it took 64 seconds for this operation to finish. All right, so now I will close the client so that um, my laptop start, stops those uh, workers. And if I now, uh, refresh this page, the dashboard is not there because I closed the, those uh, workers. Now, what happens is, and here I describe those task streams and here you will see the tasks that are being carried out. So for the next part of this tutorial, I'm going to use DutchDB and DBWare to, as an IDE to connect to DutchDB and use the output files. Now, the, uh, if I go to, so if I go one folder up and output here, you see that my output parquet file is written here. And if I had like those 13 million XML files, then there will be more partitions here, parquet partitions. All right, so if I, uh, for the next step. So here you can see some uh, introduction on how does it work. I can use Dask itself to read this parquet file as a parallelized uh, pandas data frame. As I said that there will be multiple tables, but each of them will be in one core and Dask will understand that those are uh, parallelized tables. But in general, the files that I export in my tasks are a little bit larger, like 100 gigabytes or so, and querying them in Python could be a little bit uh, time consuming. So what I do is, thanks to my colleague Tom's introduction to DutchDB, he told me that there is this software that uses C++ under the hood, and it offers multiple interfaces to it, Python, R, and my favorite one that is a command line interface that allows me to use SQL for it. So what happens is I downloaded the Dutch DB as we followed in the previous step, that is this one here. And now I will open up DBWare, that is the community open source version of it. And all right, so it shows you some startup uh, tips and in my, GitHub repository here, I have given you a link in the steps. So in the steps above, I have given you a link on how to follow, that is this one, how to follow these photos and build a connection. But now you can follow it with um, when I'm doing it too, so that uh, you see how it works. But when you download the latest version of that TV, you will see something like this. So it has dot DB here, uh, sorry, DB where it has dot DB in all. If it was not, click on all and you will see it here. So I will choose this connection because the underlying engine that I'm going to use to parse my file is dot DB. So I will put next. Here it asks me to define a path where my uh, database file is going to be located. And I must say that this has been updated in the latest DuckDB version. So I had one step in my tutorial that was here. And I'm happy to say that this step is not necessary anymore with the latest version of DuckDB, it is already resolved. So I will go to my folder where I am having this uh, tutorial. I will open one new diary in my folder and calling it, uh, let's say, uh, DuckDB DB, just a name and it's an empty folder. What happens is inside DB where here, I will give that folder as the path where I wish to hold my uh, database. So I will give this folder and I will save it. 
Exactly. And now I need to give a name. So that was my timer. All right. So I need to give it a name here and I uh, can call it what, what this database would be. So I can uh, rename it. And if I'm not mistaken, that was a driver's name that DB, yes. And then what happens is it has already downloaded the latest version. Yes, the latest version of DB. But in case you had in the you had installed this and later, for example, DB had updated their driver or DB ever had updated, then you can come over here in libraries and put download update here and have the latest version. So because these are uh, being improved, if it gives you a, a problem with the, that can, it cannot use the former version of the database, then you can simply update it there. I will put finish and I have it here. And let me rename it to say that's touch TV, just so that we know which it was. If I open it here, now it gives me like here main views and we don't have anything here simply because we are still we don't have any views or any uh, tables built now i will use the file menu open file in the same repository i have left one simple query that is called simple query sql if you open that all right so here on the top i'm building a view to that parted file that was in the output folder. So inside the, the output folder, we built a, a parquet output. That is the information we took out with our function from XML files. Now I will give that folder and I don't need to give, because that DB is a smart, it understand that parquet could be coming with multiple partitions. So I just need to give this um, directory and say, check for a wild card with anything that is parked there. I need to change this because my repository, I have downloaded this repository and then so I will update this and copy the path and then I will copy it and paste it here. So under downloads with this tutorial under output, yes. So what happens is now I can call control and enter no active connection. What does that mean? That means that this SQL file that op I opened here, simple query SQL, is not connected to a database that is this task.db. What I do is I open this one here and I double click on this. So it now understands that for this simple query it uses this that connection. So now I will take this line and I will put control and enter and it run it. So it is successful. It says that it, the a view is gonna, is built to that parquet file. That parquet file could be a hundred gigabytes. It is the nice thing about DutchDB and these tools that we are talking about is that it doesn't need all the file to fit into my memory, my machine's memory to use it. So what does this do? It, you need to read more on DuckDB's really nice tutorials. So on, under DuckDB.org, you will have documentation. And here you will read about pragmas, about uh, different uh, functions and how do they work, the numeric functions and similar to that. But what happens is I say, create a view, call it Orchid, the name of that view. And what is that? Select everything from scanning this parquet file that is here. Now, if I refresh here, this main that I had here. So if I refresh this under views, now I have Orchid. If I click here, it shows you that there is three columns. What are these three columns? These are the ones that I indicated in my Python code. That was first name exactly, so here. So it was author's first name, author's uh, orchid ID, first name and last name. These are the outputs that I gave here. 
if I would like to see them, like if I have multiple views, then I can see a like ER diagram like this. So it shows me like the whole diagrams of anything that I have like this and the tables and it shows connections if there is any connections between them so that you can even export that or as a table or schema. So now I will say as a simple code, SQL code, take everything in Orchid limiting to first 100 rows and print them in the results. So I will put control enter here. And here you see that Orchid ID is here, then first name, last name. So this is how DutchDB works. And I can query uh, this parted file that could be a really large parted files. In this example, it is small, but it could be a large parted file and it works really fast. Then I say, for example, another example SQL, I say count everything in this table, count distinct orchid IDs, count distinct first name and distinct last names from um, the main and view that is called orchid. That is this one, this view that I built here. So if I call this, I can pin this re result here so that I keep it and I can come back to it. Now, if I call this other line with control enter, it goes and it does. So it, it counts all those lines that I have in my table that is 500 because I had 500 XML files. Then counts unique orchid IDs. That's, that is again 500 because they are unique or in all authors. First name of authors, as you might guess, is not unique. It might, there might be similar, for example, two authors with the same name, John, first name, or two authors with the same last name. So here you see that the counts of them are smaller than 500 because uh, the number of unique names are less. So this was a brief tutorial. I think I'm like about five minutes above the, the 30 minutes time, but uh, yeah, this was just a brief introduction to how to use Dash, DB, and DBWare. And you can find the tutorial publicly available here under my name in Dash, DB, DBWare on GitHub. And have fun with parallelization and let me know under uh, issues here uh, if there was a problem with installation or something. And you will see it, um, the photos of these UIs and uh, how they are look like and then the simple uh, SQL file that I gave you here as well with a little bit more info on Pragmas, how to increase the RAM you are making available to that TV or the number of threads in case your machine has more threads. Thanks a lot for listening and let me know what you think about this.